Let me talk about the Saint Benin's principle. Have you heard about Saint Benin's principle? Is it is familiar to you? Have you told you? What did they say that? Well, this, from an engineering point of view, uh, it's quite easy, right? Yeah. For instance, what happens if now I am concerned about the stress state of this table, this desk, when I put my hand on it, right? So, well, to compute that, I would have to compute the amount of forces that I am applying on it, which are distributed in a certain zone. Okay. What happens is, instead of just placing all my weight uh, on my hand, I do that just in one finger. Of course, in that zone here, the result would be different, or will be different in terms of stresses, stress, but far away, do you think it's so important if I apply the same load, but instead of applying in, on, on a distributed surface, I apply that on a point, a point force? That is what the, the Sembenan principle says. The Sembenan principle says the following. Imagine that I have a body which is uh, subjected to a certain f actions, right? Typical forces on the boundary, okay? And that's what we call the original law system. Then, maybe for me, it's easier to compute not that system, but another one, which is not exactly the same. Well, it's the same in the sense that we are talking about the same body, the same gamma u constraint, so the same part where the body is subjected to imposed displacement, but I change, at least in one portion of the boundary, the original uh, forces by some equivalent system of forces. What do I mean by equivalent? Well, it's what I did when I said I replace the s my weight, but first distributed on, on the surface, and then distributed in one point, or in two points, or in three points. What I mean the same? I mean that they are statically equivalent. You know, the two systems, two systems of forces, are statically equivalent if what? What are the conditions of two systems of forces being statically equivalent? First, the resulting force of the system has to be the same. First. And second, the moment the torque of the resulting forces at any point, one given point, has to be the same. Then we mean, we, see, we mean that the systems are equivalent. In other words, that we say that this system of forces can be replaced by that one. This system of forces having a resulting force passing to the gravity center. And this system being different, having the same resulting force and having the same gravity center, so to speak. Right? So we can do that. And what happens about the elastic solution? Elastic solution. If we do that, well, the Semenans principle, Semenans, another big name of elasticity, continuum mechanics, another engineer of the 18th, 17th century, so one of our ancestors, Semenan uh, postulated the following. Well, far away, far enough from the point where I've made the changes. The solutions in terms of displacement, the strain, of stresses are going to be the same. Okay? Well, not the same, very similar. In fact, curiously enough, there is no uh, rigorous, rigorous uh, anal analytical proof of that. Okay? It's really, really complex. <coughs> I've, I've seen some of them, but no, none of them is, for me, convincing enough. Convincing enough mathematically. Okay? It's just like a, like a postulate, eh? or like a principle. We know that it's true. And when we make experiments, if we just make experiments, and we see what happens in the original and the modified situation far away from the point I applied the load, we see that the, the, the stresses are the same. The displacements are pretty much the same, and so on. So that's corroborated by experiments, by some analytical procedures, and some specific cases. But it's taken as a principle. And we engineers apply it very much, you know. You know, without that, without that, the concept of generalized stress, you know what generalized stresses are? Sforzos, sforzos, right? The bending moment, 
the axial for, um, generalized stress, the axial force, and the shear force, they are nothing else than replacements of a certain distribution of stresses by an equivalent, stackly equivalent resulting force. So the concept of, of generalized stresses, which is the basis for the structural analysis in, 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 in beams or in, in framed structures, you know, is based on that. Otherwise, we couldn't do that. I, I'll give you uh, an example. The, the, best, the most simple example, the most simple uh, structural analysis problem. Imagine you have one bar with a, 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 just a, a point force at the end, right? So the solution of this problem is extremely, extremely complex. Extremely complex. Why? Well, the stresses are all concentrated here, are really concentrated here. And then, a little far away, we see that the stresses, that these are called the high isostatic. We'll talk about that. So the isostatic lines, which are joining here, very grouped, so they, they mean that there is a singularity in the stress field. Theoretically, the stress field here is infinity. Infinity, because it's a force divided by an infinitesimal stress. So the analytical solution of that is very complex. It can be found, but it's very complex. But a little, a cer at a certain distance of that becomes a solution. Look, now consider, let's consider the same bar, the same length, the same forces, but now we replace these point forces by a distributed sense of forces which are the force divided by the cross-section, okay? That force divided by the cross-section, so they say that this, this could be the generalized stress. And that could be the real, or I mean, uh, uh, idealized, sorry, idealized equivalent system of forces of that. Look, the solution of that, math the mathematical solution of that, it's almost trivial. The stress, for instance, is constant everywhere and it's the force divided by the area. We cannot say that here. Look, here, that solution and that solution is pretty much the same. Okay? So what do we do? We, as engineers, engineers said, okay, what, what, why do I need the solution in this bar? Well, because I want to design the bar. I want to know what is the cross-section. I want to know, okay. So what I do? The solution in here, it's really very difficult and very specific, very difficult to compute. So let's design the bar in for the most of the part of the bar. So keeping away the singularity part, the, the ends. So let's design the bar to what we call an axial um, uh, axial stress state, right? Uh, constant axial stress state. And you know the solution for that. So you have to study this problem, which is what is uh, the axial uh, 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 st axial uh, uh, stress uh, state of a of a rod. We know the solution, the displacement, blah 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 blah. And then we design that bar according to that solution, because we know it's easy and blah blah. And then what do we do in practice? Well, once we have designed the bar, we produce here some additional reinforcements, for instance in order to prevent that part that we are somehow, we don't know very much. So if we had here some force, which is not exactly distributed, but applied to a certain, then when we put some reinforcement here based on heuristic or experience and so on, okay? So the concept of generalized forces, which allows to deal of this bar as a rod subjected to a constant distribution of the stresses, blah, blah. What you do in strength of material is based on the fact of the semblance principle. Okay? So that's very important, in fact. We are using that every day when we compute structures uh, based on the generalized stress concept. Okay. Another point that we have to discuss uniqueness of the solution. You are engineers, we are engineers, okay? So imagine that we design one structure, one dam, a dam, or you know, uh, a tunnel, or you know, a road, whatever, and we find the solution, the elastic solution, we solve by some way, finite elements or whatever, but at the end of the day, we are solving the 
system of equations of elastic of elasticity, right? We solve the system of equations. And we find a solution in displacements, in the stresses, in the strains. Well, that's good. We have a solution. But what if there are other solutions? What if there are more solutions of that? I never said that this is the, other, the solution I find is going to be the only one. So as engineers, I wouldn't sleep comfortably as engineers. Because what is the solution that I've taken is, so to speak, favorable. What is there is more um, other unfavorable solution, more demanding to the structure? And then I haven't taken into account that solution, and the structure fails. So for an engineer, the point of having a solution is not the, 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 the final uh, issue. For engineers, the, 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 the issue is to find the most unfavorable solution and design the structure on, on, on the basis of that. And by the way, this happens sometimes. So we have to look for all possible solutions and design or check the structure uh, in front of all of them, and specifically in the most unfavorable of them. Okay? So the issue is that if there are more than one solution is really a real concern for us. A real concern. And now I'll give you something, I'll tell you something that will make you sleep comfortably all the night. In elasticity, in elastic problems, the solution is unique. The solution is unique. So if I find one solution, that is the solution. Okay, so now I just have to check the structure, or the, the, all the points of the structure, whatever, for this specific solution, and then I'm sure that at least from the theoretical point, there is no possibility from this sign of mistake. Okay, there is no other solution. How is it proved? The proof of that, I mean, it's a lot, lot of, no, it's, not, it's mathematically it's not complex. It's based on the operators being uh, linear, right? Everything, the operator are linear. And then we use, uh, in the, the way that this do is something that is quite frequent in science, which is the reductio ad absurdum. You know what is that? So you make, you make a proposal, and following this proposal, you arrive to something which can be proven false, then means that the proposal will false. Was, was false, right? So that's the same. In that case, what do, we, what do we do? We imagine that we have two solutions, right? We have two solutions, and then we just do some operations on the, based on the equations we have to solve on these equations. We replace the two solutions on these equations, solution one and solution two, and we replace it to here. And we arrive, finally, that the difference of two solutions have to be zero. So the two solutions are the same one. Okay, so uh, that's the way it's, it's done. And if, if there is no possibility of having two solutions, there is no possibility of having three solutions, and blah, blah, blah. So the, the spirit of the, of, the, of the proof is that, the reduction of certain, and then after that, it can be rigorously proven that, I'll tell you, in linear elastic problems, and I said linear, because a large part of the solution is based on linearity. For instance, what I told you, the stresses, the stresses are proportional to the strains, or the strains proportional to the stresses. If this is not the case, <laughs> have to take care. There could be more, uh, more, more solutions. Or they, these equations are linear. So even if these are partial differential equations, Double displacements, double strains. Tri triple uh, st uh, displacements, triple strains. Because the Nabla operator is a linear operator, right? So, if that was not the case, for instance, when this, the, co the geometric equation is nonlinear, you remember? When? In large strain theory. In large strain theory, here, there appears some nonlinear term, term, which is 
This, remember, epsilon equal, this is j, the gradient of the displacements. This is j transposed, or j transposed plus j. And then there, appear, there appeared here j transposed times j. This is nonlinear term. So now there is the, the fact that the, the, the strains are linear with the, displacement, with the displacements no longer holds. So in large strains, in large strain theory, we cannot make sure that the solution is unique. And these, for instance, cases in which this happens, for instance, buckling. 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 The study of buckling. Of, you know what buckling is? Eh? Buckling of, of, <coughs> of pilers, typically of structures subjected to compressive loads, but also shells can buckle. And this kind of very thin structures or very uh, high uh, pilar rods they can have the, 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 the phenomena of buckling. Buckling is due to consideration of the nonlinear part of that. And in that case, the solution cannot be unique. For instance, maybe you, have you ever studied any of the Euler buckling uh, rod? There were a number of, 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 of loads for buckling. For buckling in the first mode, for buckling in the second. So you have to take the examine all of them and look for the worst situation. It's a typical case in which we have different solutions and you have to check all them. Fortunately, I insist, whenever the problem is linear, so all the operators here are differential equations which are linear, the, this uh, uh, equation is also linear, this equation is also linear, then, then we can make sure that the solution is unique.